Welcome back to the podcast. In our last episode, we saw the rise and fall of the Saybrook Colony, originally intended as a place of refuge for the Puritan lords to escape England if need be. That insurance policy wasn't needed when the English Civil War started, and the Puritans on the side of parliamentary forces began winning. George Fenwick, after his wife died, the only patentee to come over to the New World, gave their land grant issued to them by the Earl of Warwick to the new Connecticut colony, providing it some legitimacy. Building off of that, this episode is about the colony of New Haven, which you would recognize, of course, as part of Connecticut today. But the New Haven colony that we'll come to see formed by the end of this episode was far larger in area than the New Haven you'll find on maps today. And so let's get started. The story of New Haven really begins with two figures. The Puritan Reverend John Davenport, who we met in our last episode in the Netherlands, the man responsible for convincing Lion Gardiner to go build Saybrook, and his childhood friend Theophilus Eaton, a wealthy merchant. Reverend Davenport was Oxford educated and had been the pastor of St. Stephen's Church in London. But in recent years, under persecution from the Anglican Church, specifically Bishop Loud, he had taken refuge in the Netherlands. Theophilus Eaton's father had actually been a religious instructor to Davenport when he was a young child. And so naturally, Davenport and Eaton saw eye to eye on many things. And they fell in the same Puritan circles as John Cotton. Additionally, Eaton had done quite well for himself, being part of the Eastland Company and making a lot of money off the Baltic trade. As such, with their financial and spiritual interests in mind, both Eaton and Davenport were investors in the Massachusetts Bay Company from its inception, and both had had their time serving as directors of that company. Eaton had more money invested overall, but Davenport specifically was important to funding the effort to get the king to confirm the Massachusetts Bay Charter in 1629 over the heads of the Council for New England. And so those are our credentials. You have one religious individual and one lay individual, both of the Puritan variety, who are very well connected and involved in the Puritan migration to New England from its inception. But how did they come to live in the New World and eventually make their own colony? In 1633, Loud was made Archbishop of Canterbury, already an enemy of Davenport and many Puritan members of clergy. This was a sign that Davenport needed to relocate. He resigned as vicar of St. Stephen's and moved to Amsterdam to take a lesser position in a church of like-minded English castaways. But unlike many Puritan clergy who would find their names on lists, Bishop Loud seems to have had some personal grievance with Davenport, and those grievances followed him across the English Channel, as agents of Bishop Laud would continue to make Davenport's life difficult even in a different country. As such, in 1636, he bravely returned to England, to gather his faithful followers from the St. Stephen's Parish and leave for New England, only to see the ship that he contracted, the Hector, pressed in a naval service, and everything was delayed. Furthermore, moving into the year 1637, the king passed laws requiring that you apply for a license to remove yourself to the New World. As it turns out, many authorities did not like the numbers of people and their resources going somewhere other than England proper. You'll also see this view in France at the time, the idea that colonizing somewhere else would actually make your home nation weaker, at least in the short to middle term, because you're literally losing people, their wealth, and what they're able to do for work to help move the nation along. And as it turns out, since the Saybrook patentees never relocated to the New World, the New Haven colonists would actually be the most affluent group of Puritans to leave England. To quote the historian Myrna Kagan, Many had been among the most successful merchants and traders in England. These people weren't going to be the desperate refugees that we found on the Mayflower 17 years before. These future New Haveners, in addition to having more money, they also came from generally different places in England than many of the other Puritans in New England. If you read David Hackett Fisher's book, Albion Seed, about how different folk cultures from different areas of England influenced the regional differences in America today, you will know that many of the Puritans came from East Anglia, or at least much of the Puritan leadership came from East Anglia. Many of the New Haveners would come from London, of course, but also from the county of Kent, which is south of East Anglia. 
So there are differences. And why this is important is that the New Haveners under Davenport and Eaton plan to settle somewhere in Massachusetts, the colony that they had already invested in. But as you know from the title of this episode, they do not. And this is our first reason. They are subtly different types of Puritans based on the locations of where they lived and their median wealth. The first boat of 250 colonists left in April of 1637, and they arrived in Boston by June, carrying a stack of letters from back home. Back then, letters would circulate in a community like a newspaper would, carrying personal news, local community news, but also the national news of the day. The people of Massachusetts were glad to have a, another influx of people, and especially the wealth they brought with them. Reverend John Cotton, who was a friend of Davenport and Eaton, he arranged for lodging for all of Davenport's congregation. And the general court welcomed them to settle anywhere in Massachusetts they so chose. What this group of settlers wanted more than anything was their own harbor in which to create their own settlement and under Eaton's direction, create a little maritime empire. As they searched for a place with a good harbor, they without trying found themselves at the center of the antinomian controversy that we covered in our episode on Wheelwright and Exeter and Anne Hutchinson and the settlement of Portsmouth. Hutchinson and her followers had a very different take on Puritanism than the rest of the people in Massachusetts. And in the years 1636 into 1637, her followers grew significant enough to have some political power over the General Court of Massachusetts. The antinomians weren't just a small minority group of dissidents. They had a brief moment of rivaling the established order. Now, Davenport and Eaton had just left the old world for the new to experience this religious isolation that the Puritans supposedly had in New England, only to find that Massachusetts had already been tainted. It was not pure. The apple had been eaten, and the experiment already contaminated. On top of this, after an exhaustive search of the Massachusetts shoreline, they couldn't find a good harbor that wasn't already occupied. And so Davenport and Eaton made the hard decision to begin their own colony outside of Massachusetts, somewhere, without a land patent or a royal charter. And in the meantime, their colonists spread out around the general Boston area. They sought out employment or lodging. They paid their taxes, including funding the Pequot War, and would wait for Davenport and Eaton to find a more suitable place for them to settle. Now, at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, how did Anne Hutchinson's family and her followers and Wheelwright's congregation, how did all these people have trouble in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, whereas Davenport's congregation immediately seems to have been welcomed and fit in? Well, the first reason you already know, wealth. They had a lot more of it per capita, and they were bringing it into Massachusetts. The second reason will become evident once we found our little settlement of New Haven, our colony of New Haven. Davenport's congregation and the future colony would be the most Puritan of Puritan in nature. Even with the divisions in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and these different dissident beliefs and the separatists nearby in Plymouth who are kind of merging with the Puritans of Massachusetts, Davenport is shepherding a flock of people who are the exact middle of Puritanism and oddly enough, extreme in expressing how Puritan they are. And it also helped that Reverend Davenport, other than John Cotton, was probably the most famous Puritan reverend in the colony, or even in the New World. Inquiring about the land outside of Massachusetts, Eaton spoke to Reverend Hugh Peter of Salem, who told Eaton about his trip to the Saybrook colony, who greatly praised the geography of the land and suspected that there were good harbors further to the west. Saybrook also had Lion Gardener, an associate of John Davenport. Davenport had convinced Lion Gardener to take the job as chief builder and engineer of the Sabra colony in the first place. And so he had friends in the area. Come the end of August 1637, Eaton led a group of people to scout out the area around the southern coast of New England. They found a place with potential in an area that the natives called Quinnipiac. While this seemed like the optimal place to start their colony, it was getting late in the year. You couldn't move your settlers there, plant crops, and then harvest it in time for winter. They would have to remain in Massachusetts. Eaton would return and then organize this exodus, but he left a bunch of people there to start building and to hold the claim. This would include Joshua Atwater, Francis Brown, John Beecher, Robert Pig, and Thomas Hogue. 
and a few other men whose names have been lost to history. At first, these men lived in a single hut as they built different structures in the would-be New Haven colony. On the one hand, it sounds like it must have been a pretty lonely and dreary winter. But on the other hand, because there was so much work to be done, it might have passed fairly quick. It's known that they spent the winter cutting down trees and sawing boards. They cleared brush. They hunted. They trapped. They got to know the natives in the area, the very small Quinnipiac tribe, and became quite friendly with them. Eventually, they were able to build out into a couple different huts, and they did build a dock. One person did die over winter. Now, as a testament to the leadership of Davenport and Eaton, back in Massachusetts, they not only were able to gather pretty much all of their original settlers, but over the winter were able to attract more interest in their new venture. And so they would be leaving Massachusetts with more settlers than they came with, much to the chagrin of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Also, Reverend Davenport had been in communications with different reverends back in England who had their own flock to tend over. And after the foundation of New Haven, he would be encouraging them to come over and settle near them. And so we'll see a number of little towns pop up around New Haven that will eventually become the larger New Haven colony, each of them being created around a different reverend. Davenport and Eaton, since they had been investors in the Massachusetts Bay Colony for some time now, they weren't as clueless as the original Plymouth founders, for instance, as to how to build a colony, how to create an agricultural base. They were very well supplied. They had a differentiation of labor. One thing they were lacking when they came to Massachusetts was any sort of military contingent. They didn't have a Miles Standish of their own. And after the Pequot War, they found it necessary to hire some people out of Massachusetts to serve as militia captains once they got to their new settlement. And so from the onset, New Haven looks like the most promising Puritan colony in the New World by far. And when they arrived at Quinnipiac in the spring, their first order of business was to purchase the land from the natives, whom the builders over winter got to be quite friendly with. Now, the Quinnipiac told the English settlers that they had been devastated by raids from the Mohawk to the west. And now they only had 47 men of fighting age. What they wanted more than anything from the English was their friendship and protection. If you think about Osamaquin and the Wampanoag, how he used the Plymouth settlers to elevate his profile greatly. Or if you think about Uncas and how he used the Puritan colonies to help him absorb the Pequot. At this early date, having a small settlement of European allies nearby could be quite beneficial for specific leaders especially if the wave of plagues from the old world diseases had already gone through. This might sound shocking to some of you listeners, especially if your knowledge of European and native relations is steeped in 19th century American history, where the conditions are very, very different. At this time, the 1630s and 40s, the native Americans are still very much considering one another to be their primary enemies and the Europeans too few in number to really have uh, much of a concern. This will certainly shift later in the 1640s as we get into Keefe's War in New Netherland, which we covered in season one of this show. But for now, the Quinnipiac tribe very much needed allies against the Mohawk. To quote the historian Edward Atwater, Delivered from the fear of their eastern enemies by the extinction of the Pequot tribe, they gladly received the English planters. Davenport and Eaton purchased the land from their chief, Mamauguin, and they knew that the English did not respect native land claims, not by themselves without some sort of parallel grant of land from an English authority. The Committee on Foreign Plantations, or the earlier Council for New England, they always qualified that, yes, you would have to satisfy the natives for their land. But before that, the English would have to purchase from one of these authorizing bodies permission to settle that land. And so essentially, you have to buy the land twice. And the New Haveners, having no permission from any authority back in England, in their eyes, did not legally possessed the land, even though they had satisfied the natives. But it is known that the Dutch, just to the west of them and their main competitors, did acknowledge native land deeds. And so it was important to purchase the land to, one, get along with the natives, but also to keep the Dutch out of New Haven. Shortly thereafter, they made a second purchase for a plot of land called Tatuket, which would be the future site of Branford a settlement that'll fall into the New Haven colony. And so from 1638 onward, there was plenty of land, not very many English, and a, a very small amount of Native Americans. 
Now, the New Haven colony will often be praised for not having conflicts with Native Americans, like you'll see with Plymouth and the future King Philip's War, or with Massachusetts and the Pequot War. But to quote Marguerite Alice from her Connecticut Trilogy work, New Haven has always proudly proclaimed her lack of Indian troubles. This truth is due less to the tact of their founders than to the fact that there were no more than 50 Quinnipiac braves at the time of settlement. The tribe had been subjugated and depleted by the Pequot. It truly was the amount of space that would keep the peace. Also, we're at the end of the English Puritan migration to New England. They, of course, didn't know it at the time. But from 1638 on, the numbers are going to begin to dwindle for many of the same reasons that we mentioned in the Saybrook episode. English authorities were making it harder and harder to relocate to New England, and there is a brewing civil war which will break out. And many Puritans in New England will actually return back to Old England to fight for the parliamentary forces. And so when we get to our next episode on the United Colonies of New England, you'll see that from Plymouth, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, New Haven, as the fourth member, was the smallest and always will be. But for now, there's lots of optimism, lots of opportunity on the horizon. It's known that they didn't call their little settlement New Haven until, officially anyway, until September 1st of 1640. Until then, it would show up by its native name, again, Quinnipiac. The settlers set up New Haven in nine squares, sometimes described as rectangles, nine blocks that would make the center of the town. The church, of course, being the first real structure that they built and probably the largest outside of Eaton's house. His house was two stories, had at least 10 rooms, and is recorded as having 19 fireplaces. This is a massive building. And while his was the largest and most elegant, many in New England would criticize the New Haveners for the amount of resources they put in just building their houses. And again, they started out with more resources than the normal New England settler anyway, so their houses were pretty nice by comparison. They would set up tents and live in the basements of their houses as they built them. Throughout 1638, they would get water from streams and rivers until the wells could be dug. Compared to houses of today, the windows were much smaller because you wanted to keep in as much heat as possible. Of course, they would have functional shutters and the actual pane would not be glass, but in a thick oiled piece of paper to let light through. Of course, as glass became more available, it would replace the oil paper. With New Haven underway, Davenport and Eaton while rightly creating an agricultural base right there in their little settlement, had a longer view and were planning on settling these reverends and their flocks on nearby plots of land and having their communities ultimately be the agricultural part of the New Haven colony and New Haven itself the administrative and business center. And that's because Eaton really wanted New Haven to become a new Puritan Phoenician empire. While New Haven would be the center of his planned New Haven colony, there would be other settlements that he planned on Long Island, and then further even closer to New Netherland, and then down on the Delaware River. And in his vision, New Haven would rival New Amsterdam or Boston. But again, there are some contrary winds blowing. As I mentioned before, and they're not aware of it, the Puritan migration is starting to shut off. It's starting to dwindle downward. And so New Haven will spread out into new towns and they will come together and make a larger colony. But not as many people are coming over as they would have wished. Also, part of making this merchant empire is uh, participating in the fur trade. There wasn't much else that the Native Americans were able to produce that could be exported back to the old world that they would find of any value. Furs were one thing specifically, as especially the beaver were hunted to the far hinterlands of Russia by this time in Europe. And while other native products like wampum would be useful to Europeans living on the North American coast, wampum was not something that had a very large market in Europe, didn't have very much value in Europe. But furs did, and New Haven being set up in 1638 in southern New England came very late to the fur game. To the west, the traders in New Netherland had long been trading up and down the Connecticut River, recently chased out, of course, by the English. And then to the east, the Plymouth settlers, of course, had trading posts set up for the last 18 years or so, going from the far southwest as close to the Dutch as they possibly could get without causing conflict, all the way up the coast of Maine. And as I mentioned before, beaver do not procreate like other rodents, 
They're not so inclined to multiply as quick as a, a mouse would or a squirrel or the infamous rabbit. And so by the 1640s, there really wasn't as much money in the fur trade as 20 or 30 years before. And whereas Eaton thought that the Dutch would be an asset and a trading partner, we'll find they became more and more competitors to the settlers of New Haven and their business interests. Moving into August of 1639, New Haven, having been settled for a little more than a year, still did not have a formal government, finding no need for one yet. But they did have a church. The church came before the state. And we've seen this in many of our little southern New England colonies. But finding need to now make a government, it was the chore of church members to create that government. Suffrage would only be granted to male heads of family who were, again, accepted church members. Remember, in the Puritan world, you can go to church, but you may not be a member of that church until you've been accepted, until you've had an experience of grace, and your election has been verified by others who are elect in the community. And so specifically, the church members selected seven of their own. Those seven then appointed the first government of New Haven from among themselves. Eaton, of course, being the chief magistrate, and then four others from the remaining six would be deputies. So you'd have one magistrate at the top, four magistrates underneath. Everyone served a one-year term. There would be a clerk and a marshal. Probably the other two church members that didn't end up being deputies would be the clerk and the marshal. This first government would be officially installed in October of 1639, and their meetings would be held in the church. And so figuratively, the government was derived from the church membership. And then literally, the church contained the government. And yet there was a subtle separation of church and state in that the clergy could not. They were It was illegal for them to serve in the government. And so it wasn't a theocracy, as some people color it. There is a, a slight variation on a theme anyway. The historian John Pomfret says, Davenport was the pastor. Eaton was the dictator. And yes, New Haven and this iteration of the government would be more Puritan than the other Puritan colonies. Back in 1636, Reverend John Cotton presented to the Massachusetts General Court a plan of government based on the Old Testament, based on the government that Moses had and Aaron the priest. Further elaborated on by Leviticus and Deuteronomy, this reconstruction, as he could best do, became known to history as the Cotton Code, which Massachusetts politely rejected, but greatly influenced this first edition of the New Haven Plan of Government. One distinguishing characteristic that you'll find in the Cotton Code and in the Plan of Government for New Haven and not in the other Puritan colonies is that there is no right to trial by jury, since the Old Testament doesn't mention a trial by jury. And the New Haveners agreed with Cotton. Since it's not in the Bible, they weren't going to have it. The judge would be the judge and the jury. The historian Isabel M. Calder says of New Haven that it was the strictest of Puritan commonwealths. And at the time of the passing of their plantation covenant, the town had about 500 residents. But despite their high and mighty plan of government, and the claim of later historians that they had wonderful relations with the Native Americans. One day after the formation of this government, a local native who was wanted for murder was dragged into town. He admitted to the crime, was found guilty by the judge, had his head cut off and displayed on a pole in the market, which would be found in the center of the nine squares of New Haven. This very same year, New Haven would begin budding off into new settlements, the first of which would be the settlement of Milford under the direction of original New Haven settler Peter Pruden. He led a group of settlers, many from Hereford, England, that were distinct enough that they remained somewhat separate among the New Haveners. And a year or so into settling, they wished to spawn off into their own municipality. Pruden purchased the land of future Milford from the Sachem and Swantaway, and managed to wrangle in 54 of the different families of New Haven to follow him. In what could have been a volatile situation, it was a rather peaceful separation and something that Eaton specifically wanted for his little colony of New Haven. Again, if Milford could take up the drudgery of farming, New Haven could be well-fed and then take up the more exciting prospects of a merchant empire. 
This new Milford group, while still in New Haven, actually organized their new church congregation. Again, they made the church structure before a government structure. And when they did find it convenient to create a government, it was very similar to the New Haven government. One exception being that all freeholding men were allowed to vote. They were given suffrage. But in order to run for a position in the government, you did have to be a church member. More specifically, their system consisted of five judges who would be on the general court. Each one would be able to conduct a trial and rule without a jury. And then collectively, they could call for a meeting of the general court when necessary. And now you must be saying to yourself, well, are New Haven and Milford connected in any way? Other than being friendly neighbors, at this early date, they are not. There is no colonial government over the heads of both local governments. New Haven is one settlement, one colony. Milford is its own entity, its own colony, neither of which are recognized by England proper. And of course, this will change. And while Milford was an expansion of these New Haveners to the west, toward the east, closer to what was the Saybrook colony, a group of New Haveners under Reverend Henry Whitfield purchased a chunk of land. That would be the future site of Guilford. They purchased the land from the Squaw Sachem, so the female Sachem, female chief, Shumpisha. And even though Guilford would get a later start than Milford, it was built up pretty quickly because Shumpisha's people were so happy to have the English in the area, they helped build the settlement, including most famously the Reverend's House, which was made out of stone and still stands to this day. And like Milford, Guilford would itself be politically independent from New Haven, at least for now, but they're friendly neighbors. Much like the Puritan belief that you don't need bishops over the top of your congregations in the Anglican church, and you don't really need a king having any religious role at all in the process. The secular version of this is you only need as much government as you require. In other words, if local government will suffice for your needs, that's all you need. That might sound self-evident or redundant to you, but in this world that we live in today, it would be very hard to have a nation state of 500 people. But back then to those 500 people, they would think, well, why make another layer on top of this unless we need it? That would just be the path to tyranny. And in viewing their mindset, this is a great segue to move on to the culture of New Haven. Now, throughout this season of the podcast, I have avoided the Puritans for the most part until recently because the Puritans are the traditional history of New England that are in the textbooks, right? The Massachusetts colony, the Plymouth colony, the Connecticut colony. And yet I have a golden opportunity here to focus specifically on the everyday life of English Puritans, as we are now in the New Haven colony, the most Puritan of Puritanical colonies. So I'm going to drop you down into New Haven. Let's say the year is 1641. You're a young child in your house. You're surrounded by many siblings. Puritans would have large families. Ten children would not be considered obscene. And many would live to adulthood. And many of those adults would live extremely long lives. The environment of New England was far healthier for an English Puritan than the poor English living down in Jamestown at the time. In fact, your father might live to be 79 or 80 years old. That wouldn't be a strange thing for the time. Your mother, because of the trauma of childbirth, especially doing it a dozen times, had a lower life expectancy. When you were born, the women of the town came over to help your mother with the childbirth. The more well-to-do women were expected to have more knowledge concerning medicine and wet nursing. And the women who weren't so experienced with childbirth, they would be expected to help out with the pregnant woman's children and cook meals, do the normal household stuff that the pregnant mother would be doing. It was also an opportunity to socialize, exchange recipes, and advice with one another. A very similar thing might happen if there was a woman who was very sick in the community. Uh, the other women would do what was called watching. As there were no hospitals, your hospital was in your own home, and your community would be helping you get back on your feet. And so that would be your birth, and that would be what happened when you were sick. Sitting down to meals, you had three meals a day. You had breakfast, dinner, and supper. Dinner, of course, being the meal that most of us would call lunch today. But it wasn't that long ago that lunch was called dinner. I myself have known some older folks who have referred to it as such. And there were no ovens yet as we know them. There wasn't even like a Franklin stove. You cooked in a cut-out alcove above a chimney, somewhere between 
just a regular fireplace today and like a pizza oven. Excuse any inaccuracies, that, but that's the best way I can describe it. And in this fireplace, you would have your pots and various hangers. And women from a young age would develop this very fine skill of sensing the appropriate temperatures, knowing where to put pots and pans, and being able to sense when something was cooked just right. I guess this would be akin to someone who really gets into barbecuing. That might be the best analogy for today, or somebody who does a lot of cooking when they're out camping and are really skilled with Dutch ovens. When you were eating your meals, you'd be eating them on plates of wood or pewter. Now, since we're in New Haven and there's a little more wealth to go around, you might have, at least for the richest people in the colony, the Eaton's China plates. But you probably wouldn't be eating off of them for every meal. Probably only special occasions. Just like your grandma who had that set of china she never used. Now, the Puritans were really quick with adopting native diets, corn, bean, and squash, the three sisters. But one thing you wouldn't see this early on is a potato. That's a South American crop. It had yet to make it up to the markets of North America, and especially not New England. So you're not going to see a Puritan stuffing a potato in his mouth. Anyway, as you're eating your meal and you're looking around your house, everything would look rather plain to you as the Puritans had cast away all the ornamentation of the Catholic Church and the high Anglican Arminianists. So in their homes, they would live simply, something like the Amish would do today. But there was still some ornamentation when you had the money for it. Governor Eaton was known for having fancy rugs. But again, let's keep everything in scale. If at the time having a rug made you fancy... You can appreciate how much of their material culture was purely functional. Your father would usually leave the home for work. Could be a farmer, a cobbler, could even be the town reverend. Your mother would usually do most of her work in the home. Not just keeping the home, there were certain things that women were able to make at the time that would be used on the open market to bring more money to their family. Especially cloth made of flax or wool. And women would do these things socially. They would all go over to one woman's house and have a spinning party, where they would be known to sing songs and socialize. Come our usual holiday season, the New Haveners, they didn't celebrate Christmas, at least not how we do. The Christmas of today is heavily rooted in Dutch traditions and then amplified by later American consumer culture. The Puritans might go to church on Christmas. It might be a solemn day of prayer and reflection, but it wasn't jolly, gift-giving, and full of mythical Arctic creatures. And in fact, the Puritans saw a lot of these different Christmas traditions as being rooted in the paganism of pre-Christian Britain and Europe as a whole. And thus, those traditions were not followed by the Puritans. Although back in merry old England, the general English public would have a different way of celebrating Christmas. Come the end of harvest season, they would generally have a Thanksgiving every year. And much like a Thanksgiving today, you would go to the house of your matriarch or your patriarch. You'd go to grandma's house. You'd go to grandpa's house. And the extended family would gather together and give praise to God for all that they had been given over the last year. Now let's move out of the household into the general New Haven society. If you were an upstanding church member and you and your spouse worked with your hands in order to make a living, you might be referred to as a goodman or a good wife, or if you were a woman, for short, goody. And if you've read Arthur Miller's Crucible, you'll be familiar with the term goody that would come before a name. It's a prefix. Goody Proctor, Goody Miller. However, if you and your spouse were members of the church and you didn't have to work with your own hands, in other words, you had people working for you to do the hard labor. You had investments spread out throughout the town and you had a large estate. You would earn the title of Mr. or Mrs., something we take for granted today as a prefix anyone can use. Back then, you had to have a certain standing in the community in order to use those prefixes. And so, yes, in New Haven and the other Puritan colonies, which were short on the, the fine nobles, Back in merry old England, there was still hierarchy. There were still classes. And you would be reminded of your class every time someone addressed you as you were either goody or missus or goodman and mister. And both sets of titles were contingent on you being a church member and thus part of the elect and not the damned. In early New Haven history, wampum was the medium of exchange. The native bead made from shells the dark purple variety made from the quahog shell, and then the white made from the whelk shell, I believe, were produced in massive quantities off of Long Island, not that far away from New Haven. 
the Dutch actually provided these natives with specialized tools to make wampum of greater quality and quantity because the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, and specifically their trading partners, the Mohawk, valued wampum so greatly. And so over time, in a coming together of European and native value systems, wampum became sort of a currency, whereas before it was a trading good like native copper or flint, the Europeans saw wampum as being analogous to their own hard coin, and it began to represent a store of value or a method of exchange of value versus just being another item to be bartered. Beaver pelts were also used as a method of exchange. And sometimes in the records, going from New England all the way into New Netherland, you'll see that different fines from the courts or bills of sale are reckoned not in a hard silver coin or copper coin or even wampum, but sometimes in how many beaver pelts something is worth. Now, I keep saying hard coin because I'm referring to specifically actual coin metal money made out of copper, silver, gold, which was in very low supply in New England. Most colonial powers preferred to keep their coin inside of their own country. It was seen as part of their security that they would have a large supply stored and circulating of these precious metals. It was the thinking of a mercantilist system. If gold and silver are leaving the country, even to go to a colonial outgrowth, it was a path towards powerlessness and poverty. And I say hard coin to contrast it versus some sort of paper document that we would call a dollar bill today. Paper money used to represent some amount of actual hard money. With the rise of banks in New England, eventually there would be individual bank-issued paper currency, but not so much at this early time. But there would be a small amount of hard coin found throughout New England, and surprisingly, a lot of it would be Spanish cobs. All in all, the financial systems of the day had no resemblance to the systems we use today and are actually pretty hard to even conceptualize when your method of exchange consisted of three or four different commodities that you would have to equate to one another. Despite this disorder, New Haven actually had a growing and profitable trade in cattle, and twice a year they would have cattle auctions, one auction in May and one in September. And around both these events, a fair grew up, which if you believe a lot of the stereotypes about Puritans, sounds awfully strange. But to quote the historian Edward Atwater, the Puritans were a social people. They did not retire within themselves to live recluse from human converse, but endeavored to purify their social life. In other words, they were comfortable socializing as long as it was in a manner that they could recall inside of a church building without blushing. During harvest season, they would have husking parties. The women would have quilting parties. There were house and barn raisings. Those were big social events. And there were housewarming parties, especially in New Haven, the drill days that the militia would have to hold, which normally would be dour and strict because New Haven faced very few threats, became a time for the men to play different games. They would practice fencing and shooting. They would play nine pins and they would wrestle and women would watch them and the men would try to impress the women. Not that different than today. And yes, they would drink beer. This was at a time before coffee or tea was fashionable to drink in New England or even really available. Beer was more sanitary than water, and so was a reliable drink. And days like these were a good opportunity to pass around letters from back in England or even from nearby Boston. Literacy was particularly high among Puritans, even compared to the general English public. And that's because the Puritans very much valued education and the ability of everyone in their family to be able to read the Bible. In a Puritan family, children would be educated at home from a very young age and would probably start going to see a teacher with already some idea of how to read or at least identify letters. Teachers in New Haven were awarded a small salary. Teaching was not a full-time job. And so your teacher, well, they might have been well-educated themselves, might also be the town reverend or one of the magistrates. And while this doesn't sound like much to us today, this would actually be more education than the children of Jamestown, for instance, could expect. But while the Puritans of New Haven were allowed to have gatherings, they were allowed to drink beer, and they were allowed to play some games, something essential to the Puritan belief, and going even further back to the wider Calvinist belief system, is that morality should be regulated by a municipality. Earthly governments should hold people to a standard of morality. 
and thus out those people who do not meet that measure and are perhaps not elect, and then ostracize them from the community. So New Haven had laws that would sound kind of funny today or restrictive today and are the ancestor to the blue laws that we'll still find in our world now. Here are some examples. Young people were not allowed to meet together to husk corn after 9 p.m., even during harvest season, because who knows what a late night husking could lead to. In fact, all courting among young couples would be done on Sundays after church service in the sanctified air of the Sabbath in an open public. If that courting were to progress to the point of a marriage proposal, both sets of parents would have to have knowledge of this and be accepting. All marriages had to be publicly advertised three times before they would be authorized by the government. Anything short of these laws would actually be illegal. There were laws against unmarried sex. There was laws against any unconventional sex. There were laws against blasphemy. These were all things that could bring you actual legal and physical harm if you were to cross a line. And remember, New Haven had no trial by jury. Your peers had nothing to do with this. You would be judged by a judge, and his word would be absolute. The historian Edward Atwater notes that generally, the people who committed these crimes in New Haven were among the artisans and the laborers. These would be the goodies and the good wives. And if they weren't church members, they would be just their names. They deserved no title at all at the time. Whereas the records showed that proper church members and the wealthy Mr. and Mrs tended not to commit very many crimes at all. And this would sadly be the truth of today. Those who are desperate will tend to commit more crimes. And if you're more pessimistic about the situation, those of lesser means tend to get away with crimes less often. Here's one specific case from 1642 in New Haven that'll underline the regulation of morality that we do not have today. John Wakeman buys a pig from George Spencer, a man with one eye. The pig then gives birth to a dead, deformed piglet that also had a single eye. The New Haven court charged Spencer with having carnal relations with that pig, thus creating the monstrosity. He was hung in April of that year. Now, this example is actually relatively mild compared to later witch hunt cases, but it comes from the same culture. And there is a lot of ignorance compared to us today that we can see in this case. For example, the idea that a one-eyed man, a man who loses his eye during his living life, would somehow create an offspring that had one eye, let alone create that offspring with a pig, a trial without a jury, and then a, a death sentence for having relations with that pig. The evidence for which in a court case today would be sorely lacking. And I use this example just to remind you, the listener, especially if you're an American, the Puritans are not us. The modern day United States citizen is not a Puritan and a Puritan is not a United States citizen. We often view them as our origin or some kind of primary ingredient in the melting pot that we are. The truth of the matter is we are quite different from one another. And now moving into the rituals that the New Haveners practice during the Sabbath, it'll make that point very clear. These are, after all, the most Puritan of Puritans. The historian Isabel M. Calder calls them the ultra-Puritans. Some amount of church attendance was required from everyone, whether you were a church member or not. The entire town would be participating in the service, and it was enshrined in the structure of the town. On Sunday, starting at about 8 a.m., they would hire a drummer to go out to the middle of the town and start beating a drum. He would then proceed to walk around the town to make sure everyone heard him. He would take a break, and by the time that he went out to drum again, it was expected that folks would be walking to church. Not doing so over a long amount of time could be a crime. The historian Edward Atwater says of this, Willful absence from public worship was to rob God of the outward honor rightfully belonging to him. The richer folks, or the folks who live further out, would come by carriage or on horse. But any water travel was banned on the Sabbath. In church, there was a rigid seating structure that would emphasize the social differences between the various people of the town. The middle right would be the women and the children. The middle left would be the men. And then evidence that the Puritans knew something about human nature. The far 
One end of the church would be the young women, and then way on the other far end would be the young men. So that's the right-left orientation, but front to back, they would be ranked by social standing, at least in the eyes of the church. Towards the front of the church, you'll find the governor and his family. Descending backwards, you would find other church members, and in the way back, no matter which one of the left to right aisles you ended up in, were the non-church members still required to attend. The only people of the town not in attendance would be a portion of the militia, which would be patrolling the town while everybody else was in service. Older men would usually be mixed with the younger men of the militia for these patrols to keep the youngins in line. And even the men attending church usually had a sword on them, just in case the Dutch decided to attack. Now, after the morning service was over, it was expected that if you were a church member and a decent member of society, you would also show up for the afternoon service on Sunday. This would be problematic for the people who lived on the outskirts of New Haven, especially as the town grew. That'd be quite a journey to make twice a day, and during the dead of winter, it would be downright torturous. And so what developed were these what they called Saba houses or Sabbath houses, these small little cabins that would be far closer to the center of the town that a well-to-do family on the outskirts could buy or several regular families could share in the purchase of, and then they would all cram into the same little Sabbath house, which would be a small cabin that had a single chimney. And because it was frowned upon to do much work on the Sabbath, over this intervening time between services, each family would have essentially a pack lunch that was prepared the day before, before sundown, because of course the Sabbath began at sundown on Saturday. This extended lunchtime would be a chance to socialize, although as it was still the Sabbath, it wasn't expected that you would be running around town. However, after the second service and sundown, and thus the end of the Sabbath, Sunday night was a time for socializing and going around town and catching up with folks. And again, a time for young people to court in the open eye of the public while everybody was in the middle of town. So that would be your typical Sunday. It sounds quite exhausting. And over time, your church, again, this is a grassroots movement, would come into communion with the neighboring churches. And so New Haven, Guilford, and Milford would align spiritually. And where we're heading with this is... Only following the spiritual alignment of these communities do we get a political alignment. Again, each individual town government was derived from church membership. And so colonial government over the top of everything else was only derived from a communion of those churches with each other ahead of time. The church births the government. And with that, it's time to zoom out from the village square and our little cultural segment and return to the general history of New Haven. By 1640, New Haven had expanded out in every direction, the proper settlement of New Haven, and then all of its little offshoots. Governor Eaton levied taxes using a progressive system based on how much land you owned. So, of course, the governor himself was the highest taxpayer in the colony, which by now included all the autonomous settlements of New Haven, Milford, Guilford, Branford, and Southhold on Long Island. And this would just be the beginning of their planned expansion. Again, they want to head down the coast. In late 1640, Reverend John Davenport forms the Delaware Company, a joint stock company looking to spread the people of the various New Haven settlements to the Delaware River, an area disputed between the natives, the Dutch, and the Swedes already. Nevertheless, in 1641, New Haven voted to give itself authority over the Delaware Bay region, a power certainly English authorities did not recognize New Haven to have. As during that same time period, the king granted Delaware Bay to Sir Edmund Ployden, who is described as a beloved cousin of the king. Now, supposedly, the Delaware Company had received permission from the Swedes in New Sweden to create a single settlement on the Delaware and New Haveners did settle the Delaware in the spring of 1642. But arriving from the Virginia colony, Sir Edmund Ployden himself chastised the New Haven settlers for squatting on his land and in his colony that he called New Albion, a mostly imaginary colony that the New Haveners had never even heard of. But they found by pledging an allegiance to Ployden, he would be placated and leave. However, shortly thereafter, one group of people who would not be placated by an act of submission were the Dutch, who invaded the New Haven settlement and forcibly evicted everyone from the Delaware. 
Not allowing them to return directly to New Haven, they were brought to New Amsterdam and imprisoned. Their trading post and settlement was completely destroyed, and only after being thoroughly humiliated were they allowed to go back to New Haven proper. And not to throw the Dutch under the bus, but it also appears that the Swedes in coalition with the Dutch, were responsible for the removal of the New Haveners from Delaware Bay. After this clear act of aggression, the various New Haven settlements moved towards combining with one another and creating a general covenant or general compact, outlining a unifying government and making a proper colony as Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Plymouth had become. Now, the settlements of Stamford and Southhold seem to have participated in the New Haven General Court from their foundation while still enjoying a lot of their own local autonomy. But beginning in 1642, Stamford would begin sending deputies, as they called them, to the general court in New Haven. And thus the process of breaking down a loose confederacy and building up some sort of rudimentary federalist system began. But what will be confusing in the records moving forward is that a meeting of the general court in New Haven, it's never really specified if it's a general court meeting of the whole colony of New Haven or of the local town of New Haven. And historians have only really been able to distinguish whether it is a local or colony-wide general court by who was in attendance. Were there deputies from the other settlements? And what were the issues they were discussing? It's one of those things where everyone at the time knew exactly whether it was a colony meeting or a settlement meeting. But the records don't imply, at least explicitly, what everyone at the time knew. Moving into 1643, we see the last of the founding New Haven settlements. Guilford established its church and then its local government, just like all of the other settlements. And by this time, the larger Puritan colonies of Massachusetts, Plymouth, and Connecticut had been discussing the idea of confederating with one another. As back in England, a civil war had broken out and there was no order to be sought in that direction. Meanwhile, the New Netherland colony was breaking down under the direction of Governor Willem Kieft, and a number of native wars had broken out, known collectively as Kieft's War. And so the people of nearby New England were worried about a general native uprising. The Puritan colonies decided to create order amongst themselves, and a confederation would help to keep all of them safe. The problem that New Haven had is that it, again, was still a bunch of independent or semi-independent settlements and they would be unable to speak with one voice in this larger confederation. And so they agreed in 1643 to combine into one overarching general court, and they would become properly the New Haven colony in its widest sense. And so now New Haven would be joined with Southhold, Stamford, Guilford, Branford, and Milford, and be unified just in time to join what will be called the United Colonies of New England. What they drafted was something called the Fundamental Agreement, or sometimes you'll see it as the Fundamental Orders. This would replace New Haven's earlier 1639 Plantation Covenant. At the head of this new government, of course, would be the General Court, and on it would be a governor and deputy governor. Under that would be two deputies from each of the settlements, New Haven, Milford, Guilford, and Stamford. The other smaller settlements... The smaller settlements at this time would be represented by the New Haven deputies. The court would only meet twice a year, April and October. October would be the time of elections, and there really was no separation of powers. The general court at the head would contain all the legislative, judicial, and executive authority, because the governor was part of that court. There's your executive power. The legislative power, the power to make laws, of course, would have to go through the general court, and then the judicial branch mirroring the rest of the plan of government, had a two-tiered system. There would be a local magistrate in each town who would be the judge, and again, there's no trial by jury. Any appeals would go to the court of magistrates, which would itself be made out of select members of the general court. The legal system very much derived from John Cotton's Cotton Code, as mentioned earlier. And with that, from its grassroots beginning, these reverends taking their flocks into the howling wilderness risking their lives on faith. Several settlements grew up quickly with a little help and friendship from the natives. Their churches came in communion with one another and following suit in 1643, so did their governments. And the New Haven colony was born in earnest. And with that, we've reached the end of our episode. We will come back to the story of New Haven. But first, I want to jump over to the United Colonies of New England. I've already brought it up. What is it? Let's learn about that. 
I'm Eric Giannis. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. Thank you for listening.